Hey, I'm Brett, the founder of Grow Brew. Today we're going to be making an American IPA. The basis of this IPA is 17 pounds of two row pale malt. It's also a five hop IPA. We've got Magnum, Summit, Amarillo Gold, Mosaic, and Citra. What we have right now is the mash water coming to temp in the kettle. For our liquor tank, we're using kegels over a bayou burner. And then uh, once it's to temp, we're gonna mash it with our grains in our 10 gallon igloo mash tun. For this American IPA, our grain bill has a base malt of pale, which is a, just your basic two row pale malt. We've got the Carapils, um, Pilsner, Caribbean, and Acid Malt. Um, the hops incorporated in this brew are Magnum, Summit, Amarillo Gold, Mosaic, and Citra. As far as the stats go, we have a mash temp of 150 degrees, which means we're striking the water at 162. Um, with our mash ton, it's going to settle in at about 150 for our one hour mash. The sparge water, um, or I'm sorry, the mash water needed is 6.4 gallons, and the sparge water is going to be 6.89. So it's a total water of just over 13 gallons for this brew. Um, our mash is 60 minutes. Our boil is going to be 60 minutes. Our target OG, or original gravity, is 1.064. Our target FG, or final gravity, is going to be 1.011. And the difference between the two calculate to be an alcohol percentage of 6.92. So to make a stronger IPA, you would target a higher original gravity. The original gravity is basically the measurement of how many starches you've removed from your grain bill. So the, the goal of brewing, the, tar the goal of all brewing is to remove starches from grain and then convert the starches slash sugars to alcohol via yeast, which is what the yeast does. So the higher the, the, higher the original gravity and the more efficient uh, fermentation you have equals a higher ABV or alcohol percentage. And today the math on ours 1.064 with a final gravity of 1.011 comes out to 6.92. Is our base grain, which is a pale malt, German Pilsner, Carapils, our acid malt, Caravienna. Our main flavor hop for this brew is Amarillo Gold, which is slightly lemongrassy in flavor, kind of unique to the brew. We're going to be bittering with the magnum hops. That goes at the front end of the boil and it's responsible basically for all bitterness in the beer. So some crucial things that you need that every brewer should have ready and, and available for every brew. Probably number one is we call it the little black book. This is our notebook. This contains all of our brew information. Um, everything from your target OG to your target FG your grain bill, the hops you used, at what duration of the boil the hops were introduced to the, to the beer, um, your fermentation reports. Uh, some people add s details like the weather, the music they were listening to, the shorts they were wearing, as detailed as you can get. Um, brew books are really important. Number two would be a scale. Uh, we prefer digital scales because they're, they're on within 0 0.01 of a gram. Uh, you're not going to miss your weight with these guys. And uh, those are two pretty crucial elements to your brew. With all brewing, the most important thing to remember is cleanliness. Um, if you don't start with a clean environment, your beer is susceptible to infections and other types of contaminant that will ruin your beer. Star Sand is by far the best cleaner and sanitizer for your brewing equipment. Um, this stuff gets rid of everything that's bad for beer and nothing more than that. It foams up pretty heavily, but the foam does not infuse any type of flavor in your beer. Um, as they say, don't fear the foam. So Star Sand, definitely a must have. Next we have the Fermax Yeast Nutrient. 
Um, we use this for our yeast starters. So whether or not you're using a yeast starter, yeast nutrient is pretty crucial. It gives your, your yeast the food they need to get a good jump on fermentation. Um, basically, Fermax yeast nutrients has what your yeast craves. Next we have the foam control. Um, foam control is added at the tail end of your boil and this literally is going to control your foam. It prevents boil overs and foam overs and all that good stuff. Over here we've got a spray bottle with distilled water and star sand. It's crucial to put star sand with distilled water if you're planning on saving it for a later brew. Um, tap water will destroy the star sand over time and we just use this to sanitize on the fly. We sanitize our hands, we sanitize our uh, saran wraps, caps, anything that we're adding or taking away from a brew vessel, we spray with star sand prior to handling. Uh, we've got a stainless steel mash spoon. This spoon just allows you to dough in, stir your mash, stir your boil. Um, it's stainless steel so it can be sanitized perfectly and you're not gonna be introducing contaminants at all, as long as you sanitize this spoon. Um, what do you sanitize it with? Sanitize this with star sand. Here we've got a racking cane and a siphon. This racking cane um, inserts into the siphon and creates an auto siphon. And this is what you use to rack your um, wort, your boiled wort to your fermenter or your fermented wort slash beer to your bottles or kegs. All these items are available at growbrew.com and all orders over $50 receive free shipping. To our grain bill, this is uh, seven of the 17 pounds of pale malt that we're adding to our, our actual mash. Right now, we're adding the remainder of our pale malt. This is 10 pounds to bring us up to our 17 pound um, requirement. Beautiful. After adding 17 pounds of pale malt, we're adding one pound of carapils. Next up we have our German Pilsner, uh, one pound in the mash tun. Here we have eight ounces of Caribbeana. Last but definitely, definitely not least, we've got uh, 3.2 ounces of acid malt. Right here we're prepping the dough in. That is when you take the heated water from your hot liquor tank and basically move it all into your mash tun. So you're mixing the heated water with your grain bill, prepping for mash. So. With the temperature, our target temp was 162. We overshot it by about eight degrees and we're letting it cool back down to 162 before we dough in. So explain what's going on here, Brett. Right here, we are doughing in. Um, this is the first part to uh, mashing your beer or your grain. Um, we are saturating it as well as we can with heated water. And then uh, Luik here will be doughing it in in just a second with his paddle. 
where we mix it up and just make sure it's 100% saturated. We dough in until the grain is 100% saturated, at which point we cap the mash tun and let it mash for 60 minutes. Um, the point of the mash is to extract as many starches or convert as many starches as we can to sugars. Um, sugar is the fuel for yeast. And without sugar or yeast, you would have no alcohol. So getting every bit of water that you put in your hot liquor tank, into your mash tun is critical. So now that we're completely doughed in, we've capped the mash tun, keeping the heat in there. Um, our target is 150 degrees. At this point, we've started the timer on the cell phone or whatever you want to use, and uh, we're mashing for 60 minutes. So while we're waiting for the mash to complete, we've added seven gallons of fresh water to our hot liquor tank and we're heating it up to our strike temp of 162 degrees. Um, there's about 20 minutes remaining in our mash, at which point we'll pop the lid on the mash tun and start draining the wort to our boil kettle while we are sparging with the 160 degree sparge water. So right now we're pulling the bottom part of the wort out of the mash tun. What this does is basically anything that's settled underneath your false bottom is going to redistribute it on top of your grain bed. Um, it's really crucial to know and to note that you need to open your ball valve as slow as possible to avoid rapid settling, which will clog your false bottom. This will keep all wort from escaping your mash tun. As the pitcher fills, we'll talk about Luis's posture. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> Notice the curved back. It's crucial to brewing. Uh, he's redistributing the bottom part of the wort on top of the grain, the grain bed. Um, it's as you're sparging. Basically, what you're going to want to do is let your mash out into your boil kettle slowly, and keep a small layer of wort on top of your grain bed. Because what you're trying to do is keep that grain bed suspended on top of your false bottom. If you have the full weight of the grain bed placed on your false bottom, there's a good chance that you're gonna clog it up um, or slow distribution. So this is a really good practice. Um, just something to note, take the first runnings, pour it back on top, and then proceed to drain your, or drain your mash into your boil kettle. So this right here is a sparge arm, also available at growbrew.com. The sparge arm has this little spot on the bottom. I'm not sure if you can see it right there. Little spot on the bottom and this catches the sparge water and kind of sprinklers it out. It distributes and disperses your sparge water like a little fountain um, that just you know showers over your grain bed. Um, to ensure equal distribution of sparge water. And, and again, you're, not, you're trying not to create any water fissures. You don't want any direct shots from your top, of your top of your grain bed to the bottom of your mash tun. You want it just to be a solid grain bed, and this is what the sparge arm does. And now we can release the wort slowly as not to clog your false bottom. And at the same time, we're gonna slowly release some sparge water on the top of the grain bed. This should be kind of like the same amount going out as is coming in. What are we doing over there? You're good on that. Okay. 
And what we're gonna need to do here is actually elevate our kettle a little bit to get some more gravity. So here we elevated the hot liquor tank to get more of a gravity feed into our mash tun for sparging. Um, sitting on top of the burner, it wasn't high enough to provide enough flow, so we just threw a quarter barrel keg under it and we're good to go. Lots of flow, sparge is looking good. So at this part of the process, we have sparged our mash and what that basically means is we've drained our wort into our boil kettle and we've sparged the remaining sugars from the top of the grain patty, the top of the grain uh, bed down and we're running clear liquids right now so we're going to go ahead and call this, uh, call this sparge and we've hopefully hit our numbers and successfully pulled all of the sugars out of the grains. Don't forget to shake it twice. <laughs> cool. So the mash tun is now empty and we are going to place the boil kettle full of our fresh wort on top of our burner and proceed to boil for an hour while adding our hop additions. All right, so at this point in our brew, we have mashed our grain. We've drained our wort into our boil kettle, which you saw previously. And now our wort is in our boil kettle coming to boil. At this point we're waiting for our wort to boil and once it's boiled we're going to be adding our hop additions, world flock tab, uh, anti-foam and all that good stuff. So it's 10 minutes left in the boil and we are adding our mosaic hops. All right so now that we're wrapping up our boil we've added all of our hop additions and the boil is at zero minutes, so we've added our final hop. Um, prior to starting to cool your wort, we dip our wort chillers in our star sand, and then before the boil is killed, we dip one wort chiller in the boil. That actually kills all the bacteria and all that other good stuff, because at this point, we are post-boil. It's really important to make sure that nothing touches the wort that hasn't been cleaned. Um, so we have one sterilized wort chiller in the wort and we have one wort chiller daisy chained into this container right here. We are going to put 100 pounds of ice in the container, sprinkle it with salt to bring everything straight down um, to temperature and start circulating water through the wort chiller in the ice and it's going to go from there to the wort chiller in the wort, um, rapidly cooling our wort to yeast pitching temperature which is around 71 degrees. Right now we just turned on the water to the wort chillers and we are waiting to commence circulation to cool our wort. Circulation has commenced, we are cooling. I know you're amazing. I don't know if I talk to you. You want to do it? I thought they put it through there. So now that we are cooling the wort, it's really important to remind you guys that anything post-boil is prone to infection. So as soon as your flame is off, flame out, you don't want to touch anything that hasn't been sterilized to the wort. That includes your chiller, anything that you're using to rack into your carboy or bucket. Everything has to be sterilized from this point forward. Crucial note. So as our temperature drops below 100 degrees, it starts to slow less and less. So basically our high volume of water going through is catching less heat going through the copper wort chiller. So what we do to curb that is on our little valve here, and you can do it on your spigot at home, it doesn't need to be a valve. Um, we lessen the volume of water to slow the flow through the copper chiller, which retains more heat in the water flowing through. So once it drops under 100 degrees, you want to lessen the, the flow of water and you're capturing more heat on your way out. So this is a butterfly valve. Um, it's connected to a three, two three quarter inch uh, hose fittings. And what it does is 
it slows the flow of whatever you're putting through it. Um, right here we're off, and right here we're about a quarter open, and it's the perfect flow to cool your wart under 100 degrees. All right, so we're at 84 degrees, approaching our 70 degree yeast pitching temperature. Um, for this batch of beer, we did a yeast starter. Uh, we're gonna do a video on the yeast starters later, but as for right now, um, if you just have regular yeast, um, the White Labs California Ale WLP001 will be fine. Um, basically, once you reach 70 degrees, you drain it to your carboy and pitch your yeast. So that's what we're approaching next. So uh, once you sanitize the inside with the star sand, you wanna make sure that you spray everything around it. So you wanna make sure that this is all uh, sanitary as well. So that star sand, you can put that in a bottle with distilled water and uh, spray that pretty much on everything. You can do it on like the uh, saran wrap as well. So basically we're just sealing that until we run the uh, wart into the uh, carboys. We are now racking our finished wort into our fermentation chamber. In this case, it's a five gallon glass carboy. Um, and we are going to level both of them off to equal capacity prior to our actual trub being washed into our carboy. So we're trying to keep this as clean as possible. Um, this is prepping us for our yeast pitching. After this, we'll pitch the yeast and set her to ferment. Spray that spritz the I just I just turn the hose the hose. Like as it goes in. Yeah, come on. So it just happened right there, Rhett. We just transferred the racking hose from this carboy to this carboy, and we made sure to spray the line as we touched it with fresh star sand. This makes sure that you have no contamination in your beer. When it was about three quarter capacity for our brew. We wanna make sure that our carboys are even since we're splitting the bounty of this brew. And uh, we don't want any trub in either of them. So we wanna cut it a little short, fill this one up, and then even them off until the trub starts to flow through the hose. Basically the trub is the excess from everything you added during your boil. So this is all of your hops, this is your anti-foam. This is like any grain remnants that ended up into your boil kettle. Trub is everything that you've put into your beer during the process of making beer. Okay. All of your solids. So what are some tips for kind of dealing with this or avoiding it? Tips for avoiding it is to uh, cut your racking. Like as, you're, as you are racking your wort into your carboy, you're gonna wanna cut that before your trub runs into your carboy. It's not the end of the world if you run your trub into your carboy though. It's just gonna require further filtering or clarification post-fermentation, which could involve gelatin. It could involve um, filtering, like a keg to keg filtering system. Anything of that sort will get this trub out of your beer. And it's just gonna result in better, more clear final product. Going. All right, let's go back. Um, little moss. All right, Mike. All right, take that off and cover it. Smell Lizzy? Lizzy! Now we need to. Start on. We need to uh, shake these up. Now that our carboys are even, as far as our wort distribution goes, we can. You have two options as far as oxygenation. Oxygenation is key in yeast development and healthy yeast. Um, one way is to infuse oxygen via compressed oxygen and an air stone. The other way is what we're gonna show you here. We're now oxygenating our beer. That's where you just shake it around. Give it a good loving. Mm. You wanna just love on your beer. <laughs> Yeast loves oxygen, so we give it to it.
prepping for yeast pitch. Always sanitize. Sanitize and knife. Got this. Mm -hmm. So explain what's going on here, Rhett. So right now we're pitching the yeast. In this case, again, we're using a yeast starter, um, sanitizing every point of contact with our carboy. Um, and we're gonna pitch half the volume of our 1500 milliliter starter in each carboy. We're just splitting the yeast. Now the yeast has been pitched and we are adding our airlocks to the carboys. In this case it's a number seven silicone stopper with a disassembled airlock. We stuck our blow-off tube to the top of the airlock and it's going to a blow-off chamber which is full of star sand. So it's a closed network or closed circuit. Um, CO2 can get out and oxygen cannot get back in which is crucial. still adding the blow-off tubes to the carboys. What the blow-off tubes allow, and honestly, probably in this scenario, we're not gonna need the blow-off tubes, um, but when your wort is at a high enough level that the yeast reaction creates an up foam that has nowhere to go, the blow-off tubes allow it to go into the blow-off chamber, which will stop your airlock from blowing off and allowing oxygen to enter your carboy. Right now we're filling our hydrometer tube with our finished wart. Um, what this is gonna do is allow us to measure our 
original gravity and see if we hit the numbers. So this way. It's perfect. I'll explain what Lou's got going on here. What he's doing right now is he's dipping the hydrometer into the hydrometer tube. We have our wart in here. So what we're doing is measuring the amount of starches that we've converted to sugars. That increases the viscosity of the liquid, making the hydrometer bounce up, which is what gives us our final reading. And we're gonna find out right here what we hit. What's the ideal? Our target for this, our right? target original gravity for this batch is 1.064. Okay. So what would be like a happy range that you'd be happy with? Uh. Right. Well, Do you normally get pretty close to what you get? You normally get really close, but with your OG. I'm not seeing from this guy that we hit it. Right now. <laughs> What's that? Like 10.50. So at this point, we've got our finished IPA fermenting in our temperature controlled fermentation chamber. In this case, it's a retrofitted refrigerator that we have hooked up to our uh, thermostat. Um, we have our thermostat regulating our fermentation temperature at 68 degrees. And it's gonna sit at 68 degrees until we've reached our final gravity of 1.011. Um, so we'll be testing it periodically to make sure that we've reached full fermentation at that point We will be done and racking it into bottles or kegs uh, We test it again with the hydrometer um, Periodically probably in about a week and a half We'll test it with the hydrometer and then it takes about typically two weeks to reach full fermentation Checking your beer is all about using your hydrometer you have to pull off a sample put it into your hydrometer and make sure that you've reached your full fermentation. Um, one thing that we could recommend is buying a beer bug. The beer bug will send all this information straight to your cell phone and you could know exactly what stage your beer is in at all times of day. So at this point, we are going to use our spray bottle full of star sand and water um, to sterilize the surrounding area prior to removing a sample. Once again, make sure to sanitize every object that you stick into your wart very well. Now this is the auto siphon. <laughs> there you go, we gotta cut that. I'm gonna... So what we're doing now is we're placing our auto siphon into our carboy to siphon out our sample. Um, the auto siphon allows you to start your siphon without placing the tube in your mouth, which is awesome for sanitary reasons. When you're drawing your sample off into your hydrometer, um, it's important to remember that you don't need to fill the whole thing up. You want about two thirds headspace left. Um, uh, for a proper reading. Um, you also want your wart to be somewhere between 57 and 60 degrees preferably. That's what most hydrometers out of homebrew shops are set at. So what we've got here is our hydrometer and our hydrometer jar. Um, Again, you want your beer sample filled up to about two thirds of your hydrometer jar. There's no need to fill it up to the top to take an accurate reading. What we do from here is we drop the hydrometer in the jar, getting it as far down as you can and give it a good spin. That frees it from the sides and uh, frees up any bubbles that may be stuck on the bottom of it, preventing uh, accurate reading. So what we're looking for here is a hydrometer reading, a specific gravity reading of about 1.01. .01. Um, 
that'll that'll give us just about full attenuation um, of our sugars. So we're sitting right here at about 1.01 and it looks like our beer is ready to keg. Hypothetically, if you take your reading and your specific gravity is still above 1.01, um, I'd say honestly above 1.03, anything above that, your, your wort has not fully attenuated yet so there's still unfermented sugars in your wort. Um, in this scenario, let your wort go another one to two days and take a specific gravity reading at that time. So now that we know that our beer has reached its final gravity, uh, what we do is remove the auto siphon carefully. And as quickly as possible, you want to sanitize the region, the cap of the carboy with star sand again, sanitize your stopper and replace your stopper. And then tradition for me, I'm not sure everybody is to sample your first specific gravity reading. And that's going to give you a really good idea as to how your beer is going to come out. And this one is prime time. Here we have the basic equation that you use to determine the ABV of your beer. Um, in this equation, two constants are used. You have this 1.05 right here, and you have the 0 0.09 here. The 1.05 represents the amount of CO2 produced for every gram of ethanol that's produced and the 0.79 represents the density of the ethyl alcohol um, drop you know you, it's, it's red 0.79 grams per milliliter um, and you drop the grams per milliliter to get the actual specific gravity so what you're going to do to figure out your abv is 1.05 times the difference between your og and your fg so your original gravity minus your final gravity divided by your final gravity, divided by 0.79 times 100. And that's how you get your ABV. In this case, we did 1.05 times 1.064 minus 1.011. 1.064 was our original gravity, and 1.011 was our final gravity. When you plug that into the rest of the equation, our ABV came out to be 6.92 for this American IPA. All right, so now that we've taken our sample of our American IPA after two weeks of fermenting, and we've established that our final gravity is at 1.011, which is our finishing gravity, um, giving us an alcohol percentage, an ABV of 6.9%. Uh, we lowered the temperature of our fermentation chamber to increase the density of our wort, which is gonna grab the solids out of the wort and drop them to the bottom. So basically what you're doing is crashing your beer Crashing your beer gives you a clearer beer and a better finished product in your keg. One thing to note while crashing your beer is that when you lower the temperature of your fermentation chamber, it's gonna cause a vacuum within your carboy. Uh, we've learned from experience that you're gonna to wanna to pinch your blow off lines. If you're, if you're using a blow off, pinch your lines because this vacuum will suck the star sand or whatever's in your blow off bucket straight into your carboy, ruining your beer. Um, We've drank a couple batches of star sand beer and I wouldn't recommend it. So now that our beer is crashed, we're gonna move on to kegging. Okay, so we're gonna be kegging this beer, but if you don't have the equipment to keg the beer, another option for you is to bottle your beer. What you're gonna need for that is an auto siphon, which is this guy right here. This will create the siphon from your carboy to your bottles without having to suck on the tube. Uh, making sure that you're maintaining your clean environment. Um, you couple this with a uh, spring-loaded bottle filler. Once you insert this bottle filler into your bottle, the spring will compress, allowing your beer to fill from the bottom up. So this is gonna make sure that the CO2 stays on top of the beer, giving you a nice fresh bottle. Uh, another thing required to bottle your beer, bottle caps. Uh, we sell them in bags of 200. You can also buy them in groups of uh, 400 or 800 on the website and a bottle capper. We only sell Italian made bottle cappers. We don't do the Chinese stuff here, so we're gonna have to deal with quality stuff at growbrew.com. All right, so now we're about to keg our beer, and as with every post-boil activity, we're gonna beat this horse into the ground. Sanitization, sanitization, sanitization. You want everything to be clean. So we've 
spritzed down our carboy top and stopper with our bottle of star sand. We've rinsed our entire keg with star sand through all the orifices. Everything's been taken off and sterilized. At this point, what we're going to do is pop the stopper off our carboy like this and as quickly as you can you want to take a piece of saran wrap sanitize it and keep the oxygen out of your keg so now everything has been sprayed down with star sand the keg has been sanitized and we're going to insert our auto siphon into the carboy as quickly as possible and as gently as possible and we'll wrap with this sterilized saran wrap and connect our tubing to our auto siphon. Okay. So now that our auto siphon's been inserted into our carboy, what we're gonna do is pop the top on our drain keg, drain and sanitized keg. This thing's been thoroughly flushed with star sand. And cover the opening after spraying the surrounding area with star sand. Spray more saran wrap with star sand and cover the opening with your saran wrap. What this is gonna do is give you a slight diaphragm between the atmosphere in the keg and the atmosphere outside of the keg. And then you're gonna to wanna to plug your CO2 connection into the beer outline of your keg. What this is gonna do is allow you to purge your keg of all oxygen from the bottom up instead of from the top down. CO2 is heavier than air, so it sits below the oxygen. So we're gonna go ahead and turn CO2 on and purge the oxygen slowly. After a couple of seconds, you're gonna be okay. All the oxygen is gonna be out of there and you can commence the siphoning of your fermented beer into your keg. Now that our five gallon keg is purged of all oxygen uh, with CO2, we're going to go ahead and sanitize our siphon hose and slip it underneath our saran wrap barrier. From this point, you start your auto siphon and begin dropping your fermented beer into your keg. We've got a good siphon going now and it's all going straight into the keg. You want to displace as much oxygen as possible in your keg because any oxygen that your beer becomes exposed to oxidizes your finished brew and starts instantly to spoil your beer. So it's really important to make sure that your finished beer doesn't touch air. CO2 preserves your beer. Now we just wait for the siphon to finish and uh, for our keg to fill up. Okay, so now we're to the bottom of our carboy. And before you start sucking all the trub, all the leftover hops and yeast residue and all the sediment from the bottom of your carboy, you wanna pinch your line and try to keep as much trub out of your keg as possible. Um, if you do end up sucking a bunch in, you have the option of filtering your beer after you've carbonated it, but the best thing to do is try to keep the trub out of your keg to have to avoid using clarifying agents and stuff like that. So at this point, we've pinched off our siphon. The beer is now in the keg, and we're going to spritz the top again with star sand, sanitize everything that will be touching the top of the keg with our bottle of star sand, and quickly we'll be transferring over the lid of our keg to our carboy, just like this. Get it in there, lock it up nice and tight. Good to go. Now the beer is separated from the oxygen and is stuck with the CO2 only. It's gonna keep it nice and fresh. Uh, for this point on, uh, we, have, we already have the CO2 plugged into our out line. It's a good practice, at least for myself, what I like to do is to carbonate the beer with the CO2 plugged into the outline. What this does is it infuses the CO2 into your keg of beer from the bottom up instead of the top down, so you get a nice even diffusion uh, throughout your beer. So we'll go ahead and turn on our CO2, pressurizing the keg. 
And we're gonna turn the pressure up to 12 PSI, where it's gonna sit for the next seven days to slow carbonate. This gives you a nice even carbonation and you don't risk over carbonating your beer, which you can't really come back from. So there you have it. This has been How to Brew an American IPA with GrowBrew.com. We've brought you from brewing to kegging. At this point, the beer is going to sit in our five gallon keg for seven days under 12 PSI. After that, it's going to be about the optimum amount of carbonation for consumption. And you can go ahead and tilt it back and enjoy a home brew. Cheers. Alright guys, it's been seven days since we kegged our American IPA. Um, we brought you through the entire process of making this beer from brewing it to fermenting it, kegging it, and now we're sampling it. Came out super well. It's really clear. We did get a smidge of our trub sucked through um, when we racked it. So you can't really see it on the, on the video, but we do have a little bit of trub in there. And we'll be doing some advanced videos in the future showing you guys how to clarify your beer with gelatin and other filtering methods. But for now, it's so minute, you can't even, unless you hold it up to the light, you can't even see it. So with our Citra and our Amarillo hops, <clears throat> excuse me, really come through on the actual finish of the beer. We dry hopped with over an ounce of each throughout the two week process. So it just, it, it, the aroma is just insane on this. But um, yeah, we're really happy with it. So. Thanks for watching and I hope that your beer comes out as good as ours. Cheers.